Dignitates and Cavod, Two Theological Concepts in Catalan Mysticism, by Moshe Adel. 1. The affinities between Ramon Lull and Jewish mysticism have been dealt with by several scholars. The two basic issues have been addressed in this context, the combinatory theory of the Catalan mystic and his view of the Dignitates. The first topic involves the question of the possible impact of Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, that is the main source of the medieval Jewish theory of combination of letters. The assumption that such a Jewish theory had a certain impact on the Lullian Ars Combinatoria has been advanced by several scholars, Gershom Scholem, Francis A. Yates, and more recently Mario Satz, but more eminently Erhard W. Platzik. It seems, however, that it was Pico della Mirandola who had been the first to point out the affinity between the combinatory Kabbalah and Lull's views. More recently, I have attempted to point out the possible influence of a very peculiar type of Kabbalah, which combined the combinatory theory of Sefer Yetzirah with some Sephirotic theories as formulated by Catalan Kabbalists, especially Rabbi Ezra of Girona. In an anonymous commentary on the Jewish prayer, apparently composed in Catalonia in the 60s or the 70s of the 13th century, I have found the use of three concentric circles, where the Hebrew alphabets have been inscribed together with a table where the theological significance of each of the letters has been detailed. In a note printed some years ago, I proposed to see in those drawings or their possible Jewish mystical sources or parallels a plausible source for Lull's more famous use of the same types of devices in order to extract theological and scientific truths. There, an effort was made to emphasize not only the similarities between the sources I have discussed, but also the question of their availability in time and space. In other words, in order to propose a more solid link between two phenomena, the existence of the two topics in geographical vicinity in the same period may constitute an important finding. This methodological finding seems to me important insofar as the other topic is involved. It would be, accordingly more reasonable to look for those specific theosophical theories embraced by the Catalan Kabbalists as the more plausible sources of lull, if at all, before someone resorts to an explanation that in itself may also be correct, that forms of Kabbalistic thought found outside the Catalan region might have been the source of lull's view. To put it differently, the better understanding of the history of the Kabbalah in the immediate vicinity of the Christian mystic may contribute to a more precise understanding of his affinities to Jewish sources. Raman Lal, of course, was the is, became the blessed Raman Lal and forged uh, the ideas that we should learn each other's languages and uh, better integrate our understanding of other cultures. There's a statue, a statue of him in Mallorca, in Palma, where I got to spend a lot of a good time in Zelator in 97 during the Halebot Comet and uh, delved into his his studies there. However, this proposal is still a desideratum. Modern scholarship of Kabbalah had not yet delineated in a detailed manner the various trends in Catalan Kabbalah. This is a desideratum important in itself as it deals with the main concept permeating discussions in a major phase in the history of Jewish Kabbalah, but also having some possible implications for non-Jewish thought. In more concrete terms, it would also be reasonable to treat the possible similarities between the theory of dignitates, as found in some of Lullian sources, and the Kabbalistic theory of Sephirot, found in Catalonia. This suggestion means that most of the scholarly proposals to understand Lull's dignitates, which resorted to the standard theory of ten Sephirot, did not take in account the specific Kabbalistic theories advanced before Lull, but recoursed, in some cases, to the Zaharic theosophy formulated in Castile in the period later than the decades when Catalan Kabbalah was formulated. Note Moshe Adel's Ramon Lull and Ecstatic Kabbalah, a preliminary observation from the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institute, 1988. Also see Umberto Eco, Pourquoi Lull Nate Pad un Kabbaliste, Magie de Livre, Livre de Magie, Aries 15.
Paris, 1993. 2. Let me be more specific. In his Algunas Relaciones entre la Doctrina Liliana y la Cabala, Jose M. Milas Velacroza has drawn the parallel between the Lullian dignitates, conceived as real entities within the divine nature, and identical with this nature, and the Kabbalistic Sephirot. All scholars who agreed with this pertinent comparison accepted the more general and widespread view of the divine realm as composed of ten sephirot and the higher hidden deity called, in many sources by the name, Ein Sof, the infinite God. Indeed, this is a very important form of Kabbalistic theosophy found in early Kabbalistic sources in Catalonia, even before Lull's birth and in his lifetime and afterwards elsewhere in Kabbalistic literature. However, the discrepancy between the nine dignitates in some later Lullian texts, or sixteen in earlier ones, but never ten, and the ten sephirot, contributed to the marginalization of the theory about the possible Kabbalistic source of the Dignitates in more recent scholarship. Both the theory advanced by E. W. Platzik as to the Augustinian source of Lull, or the Erigenian origin of Lull, as proposed by Yeats, have contributed to the neglect of research regarding the possible nexus between Dignitates and Sephirot. Following Yeats's great authority, no other than the famous Gershom Scholem accepted her conclusion when he indicated that I could not convince myself of any historical influences of the Kabbalah on Raymond Lull's doctrine of the Dignitates of the Deity. As regards the names and the structure of the Sephirot and the Dignitates, the correspondence is only superficial and slight, and in part the almost necessary consequence of the enumeration of the divine attributes. Precisely the number 10 plays no role at all with Lull. It seems that the trend of modern scholarship is definitely not in favor of the Kabbalistic source of the Dignitates. I too have joined this recent unanimity when I stated that it seems that the influence of the Theosophical Kabbalah on Lull's conception of Dignitates Dei can be neglected. That's in Idel's Raman Lull and Ecstatic Kabbalah. And for the earlier notes, you can see Gershom Sholem's Origins of the Kabbalah. However, I had fortunately enough qualified my agreement to this view by mentioning that it is conditioned by the known material, and if further studies will not unfold new material. Here I would like to introduce again the plausibility of the Kabbalistic source of some aspects of the Lullian theory of Dignitates. On the basis of some new manuscript material and a new reading of already known Kabbalistic texts. Since these texts were composed before Lull started his literary activity and were known, or some of them even composed in Catalonia, I take this opportunity to expose a theosophical theory embraced by some Kabbalists that was less dealt with by modern scholarship. Unlike the majority of Kabbalists throughout centuries, some early Kabbalists claimed that the first Sephira, commonly known as Keter, crown, is identical to the causa causarum, a stand that admits the existence of the ten sephirot, but assumes that the first one transcends qualitatively the other lower nine. This view is found in a text, found in several manuscripts, which belongs, in my opinion, to none other than one of the first Kabbalists, Rabbi Yaakov ben Saul, known as the Nazarite, a Provençal Kabbalist of the 12th century, living for part of his life in Lunel. Again, more on him in Gershom Sholem's Origins of the Kabbalah. This is a short anonymous text found in the immediate vicinity of the few vestiges of the teachings of Rabbi Jacob and those of Rabbi Abraham ben David, known as the Rabad. And this vicinity, together with the conceptual consonance of the terminology of this short text to those statements, brought in the name of Rabbi Jacob, brought me to the conclusion as to its authorship, and thus to the possibility that this is a very early Kabbalistic text. Ilat ha ilot, hakma bina hesed pahad, tifret netzach hod berit malchut. If my conjecture as to the identity of the author of this enumeration of the divine entities is correct, then, at the very beginning of the Kabbalah in Europe, the philosophical concept of causa causarum, stands at the beginning of a list that includes nine additional appellations of the Sephirot, 
while the name of the first Sephra, Keter, is not mentioned at all. For more on this, see Moshe Adel, The Prayer in Provençal Kabbalah, Tarbiz, 9, 62, 1993. That's a journal. This Provençal Kabbalist was the contemporary of another one, the already mentioned Rabad. Unlike the latter, Rabbi Jacob the Nazarite is not known to have established a Kabbalistic school that might have continued his teachings. The Rabbad's views, however, were elaborated in Provence by his son, the famous Isaac the Blind, and his grandson, Rabbi Asher ben David, as well as by some Catalan Kabbalists living in Girona. This school is characterized, inter alia, by the doctrine of the Deus Absconditus, the infinite Ein Sof that transcends the spiritual entities named Sephiroth which are conceived to be ten. In this Kabbalistic school, the prevailing view of the nature of the Sephirot is that they are the instruments, the tools of the divine activities, or alternatively, the vessels where the divine power dwells, or again, the modi of the divine revelation. However, it seems that Rabbi Jacob's speculations did not disappear. There were early Kabbalists, apparently in Girona of the early 13th century, who did not accept the view of the school of Rabbi Isaac the Blind as to the existence of a transcendental, trans Godhead. One of them claimed, for example, that there is no entity higher than the first Sephira, and that no one should separate the Sephirot from each other, since they are united, implying that they are divine. In other words, it seems that there is a certain nexus between the theosophy that assumes that there is a transcendent trans source of the Sephirot and the view that they are the instruments of its manifestation and of the creation of the world. On the other hand, the view that there is no transcendental entity beyond the Sephirot is related to the view that they constitute the divinity in a manner similar to the Christian trinity, where the divine personae are three but are nevertheless conceived to be one. The Sephirot are conceived of as ten, but constituting one divine configuration. The Sephirot are conceived in those fewer texts as constituting the very essence of the divine, which means that the divinity comprises those Sephirot. The most important exponent of this essentialistic approach to the nature of the Sephirot was nevertheless not an obscure figure or some anonymous text, but one of the most famous of the Catalan Kabbalists, Rabbi Moses ben Naaman, better known as Nachmanides, 1194-1270, to who lived for the greatest part of his life in Girona. In his Kabbalistic hints, and more expressly in those from his entourage, the essentialistic stand regarding the Sephirot was exposed. Moreover, one of the most elaborated discussions of Nachmanides concerning the emergence of the Sephirotic realm may be plausibly understood as assuming that the first Sephira, Keter, is conceived to be an infinite entity which is not created but is the source of the other nine Sephirot. Indeed, in some instances in this source of Nachmanides, it is reasonable to assume that he believed that there is an aspect of this Sephira that is unknown to us, Davar Ne'alam, a hidden entity, but Nachmanides never uses the term Ein Sof as a noun or an appellation for transcendental stratum within the divine. Note C. Moshe Adel on the concept of Tzimtzum in Kabbalah and its research in Lurianic Kabbalah, 1992. Also, the prayer in Provençal Kabbalah. Moreover, as I have proposed in a separate study, it is very plausible that the first Sephira was conceived to have withdrawn from the space of the Sephirotic realm in order to create the locus of the future emanation of the nine other Sephirot. Though Nachmanides does not introduce the term causa causarum as distinct from the nine other Sephirot as Rabbi Jacob had done, the idea of a sharp difference between the first Sephira and the other nine is accentuated by the occurrence of the concept of Tzimtzum, whose career in the history of the Kabbalah still awaits more detailed analysis. Tzimtzum, of course, can be well seen in the Sefer Bahir, and also there's some interesting uh, way of seeing Keter, uh, the crown, as separated in the division of the four worlds, in which Keter alone is in the Atsalutic and not including Hakman and Binah in that in that, that format.
The conception of a chasm between the first and the nine is crucial for the proper understanding of Nachmanides' theosophy. It is in this context that Nachmanides uses time and again the term kavod in order to designate each of the sephirot. Quote, the supernal Keter, blessed be he, is fuller than the heart can contemplate. His glory, kavodo, and he comprised the essence of the glory, and he made from them the essence of the glory hinted at by the divine name yod And this glory is called Hochma, and the well was flowing, and he made the essence of the glory named Bina. And the well flowed again and created the essence of the glory named Gedula and Gevura. And he made the, a glory named Elohim Haim, which are Netzach and Hod. And the well flowed and created a glory. Now a note. The text found in Nahmadi's authentic commentary on Sefer Yetzera has been printed by Gershom Sholem, Parakim le Todot Sifrut HaKabbalah, Jerusalem 1931. For an analysis, see... Moshe Adel. And the final phrase of the text cited here stands for the last Sephira, Malchut, designated in other discussions of this Kabbalist as the created glory, Kavod Nivcha. And again, you should see Elliot Wolfson, by way of truth, aspects of Nachmanides Kabbalistic Hermeneutics, 1989 AJS Review. Uh, Elliot Wolfson is the other great Kabbalistic scholar of our day and highly recommended along with Moshe Adel. We may easily detect the resort to the collective term of glory insofar as the description of almost all of the ten sephirot is concerned. The Hebrew term translated by glory is kavod, and it is indeed a biblical theological concept standing for the divine theophany. However, in Hebrew, the concept of glory is not the only possible way to understand this concept. It involves also the connotation of honor and dignity. Note that a lot of these Hebrew words, uh, like hesed and stuff, are very old and don't just have one meaning. They contain a lot of meanings and they're more uh, ideological concepts and hence theosophies in uh, the meanings that they contain. In other words, though a translation of the reference to the sephirot as kavod is regularly understood as referring to the multiple glories of the divine, the translation of this term as standing for ontological dignities is not a far-fetched rendering. Thus, at the middle of the 13th century, a Kabbalistic theosophy had been formulated in Garona that uses the term kavod as a technical term within a system that emphasizes the distinction between the first sephira described as glory and the other nine. 3. Nachmanides was a leading figure in Jewish Catalan life in the second half of the 13th century. He was well acquainted with Christian thought and participated in a well-known religious controversy in Barcelona before he left Spain. And he was in good relations with the king of Aragon. Nevertheless, his basic approach in matters of Kabbalah was of an extreme esotericism insofar as he believed that the Kabbalistic secrets should be transmitted only to a few well-trained persons among the Jews. This fact complicates the possibility of his theosophy becoming known outside an immediate circle of persons belonging to the Jewish elite who were in direct contact with him. They adopted, too, an esoteric approach. Nevertheless, his most important disciple and the recipient of his Kabbalistic secrets was a leading rabbi active in Barcelona in the lifetime of Lal. It is Rabbi Shlomo ben Abraham ibn Adret, known in the Jewish literature as Rashba. He was an exact contemporary of Lal in an insipid of a lost letter printed by Milis Velikroza. Three names are mentioned, Abraham Deneret, Rabbi Aaron, and Rabbi ben Jew Solomon. As Milas Velikroza has already indicated, the first name probably refers to Shlomo ibn Edrit. This may be an indication that some type of relation between Lal and his contemporary Jewish theologians should be assumed. It seems, therefore, that Nachmanides' secret doctrine transpired beyond the close circle of his immediate followers. In any case, a contemporary of Ibn Adret and Lal, and a person who was not a student of Nachmanides, Abraham Abulafia, describes in the 80s of the 13th century the doctrine of some Kabbalists who claim that there is nothing beyond, namely higher than the ten sephirot, and the view that the ten sephirot are 
the divinity. Though written in Sicily, this statement is addressed to Rabbi Yehuda Salman, who is probably identical to Rabbi ben Jew Solomon, mentioned by Lull. The fact that such a view was the subject of a correspondence between two Kabbalists living in different countries shows that the spell of secrecy that covered Nachmanides' theosophy was not impenetrable. Indeed, as I pointed out elsewhere, already at the very beginning of the 80s of this century, Nachmanides' most important text, presenting the view of the Sephirot as Kavod, was brought by Abulafia to Rome and copied there. You can see Abraham Abulafia and Menahem ben Benjamin in Rome, the beginnings of Kabbalah in Italy, forthcoming. Abulafia was, at least, from the early 70s, a Kabbalist who, unlike Nachmanides, was less concerned with keeping his esoteric teachings secret, even less so if these teachings belong to Kabbalistic schools that were conceived as representing a form of Kabbalah lower than his. In the middle of the 80s, he boasted that he discussed his Kabbalistic and Messianic messages not only with Jews, but also with Christians. Though I would not say that this ecstatic Kabbalist is indeed the source or the mediator of Nachmanides' vision of the Sephirot as Kavod, the above details on Abulafia's attitude and activity may point to a possibility that Nachmanides' secrets transpired beyond the very small circle of his students only shortly after the death of his master in 1270. After all, Abulafia himself received a copy of Nachmanides' commentary on Sefer Yetzira from somebody in Barcelona sometime in the early 70s. In suggesting that Nachmanides resort to the term kavod for pointing to each and every sephirot as a possible source for Lull's elusive term, dignitates, I am aware that the specific cognomens of the sephirot and the dignitates differ, and I assume that the names of the dignitates were adopted from the Latin tradition, as pointed out by Yeats. However, despite this fact, I do not see, for the time being, a better explanation for the emergence of Lull's dignitates than Nachmanides' term. Moshe Adel, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem.